Okay, uh, welcome everybody uh, to this session this afternoon on new ways of working, living and bridging the digital divide. Uh, my name is Anthony Walker. I'm Deputy CEO of Tech UK, uh, which is the uh, leading technology trade associ association uh, here in the UK, uh, representing uh, uh, close to a thousand different technology companies that work and operate uh, here in the UK. Uh, and it's a real Real pleasure uh, for me to be able to um, host uh, and, uh, this discussion uh, this afternoon. Um, I join you from uh, actually my bedroom, um, which is where uh, I've pretty much been working since uh, March uh, uh, 2020, when, uh, when uh, we first all went into lockdown. Um, and, uh, and I'm still here. You know, who'd have thought two years on, more than two years on, <coughs> that we would, we would still be uh, working uh, in this new kind of uh, uh, remote or hybrid way, uh, but, but here we are. Um, and, uh, and, and of course, this event in itself, I think, uh, there was a time when we were hoping to do it as an in-person live event, um, but uh, that, that didn't happen, uh, not this year anyway. Um, and, but, but it's amazing how we've all uh, kind of got used to uh, this new way of working and this new way of living. Uh, but it's a it's a it's a change that has real real significance for people's <clears throat> lives, for people's communities, uh, for people's businesses, um, and for the economy around around Europe as well. Um, so, uh, and that's really what we wanted to talk about in this session today, uh, in terms of uh, how the experience of the pandemic has has perhaps kind of accelerated some of the technological changes uh, that maybe were going to happen anyway. Um, they've certainly created this new world. Um, and this new way of living and working and, and, and in this world and what that means for, for people, communities and for society as a whole. And I'm absolutely delighted we've got a fantastic panel uh, with us today uh, who are going to uh, share their, their thoughts and insights um, on, on what this means uh, for all our futures. Um, and, and then we'll go into uh, a wider kind of discussion, a very open discussion uh, around some of the themes uh, that I think are expected to kind of come up uh, in, in this conversation. Um, so uh, on our panel today, uh, we have uh, Carlos uh, Zarino, MEP. Uh, we have Professor Aaron Sundarajan uh, from New York University, uh, who is a specialist on entrepreneurship and technology. Uh, we've got Clara Dobrev, uh, MEP, um, and we've got Michael Matlots, uh, who is president of Euroscience. Um, and I hope we'll be joined also uh, with, by uh, Tiffy uh, Akin Sanmi uh, from Google, who is uh, has been doing a lot of work focused on uh, uh, for Google in Africa, which I think will be a really interesting perspective. Um, but uh, to, to kick us off, um, I wanted to ask, uh, in fact, invite uh, Clara Dobrev uh, to uh, to maybe perhaps open the discussion for us and share her thoughts on uh, new ways of working, living, and bridging the digital divide. Well, uh, thank you very much, and I'm really delighted to be on this uh, panel. Also, I'm, uh, how to say, a little bit embarrassed because I'm the only one, maybe, uh, from you who is not uh, directly focused in the everyday life uh, with the business area, with digitalization. Um, I'm a member of the AMPL committee focusing on social issues, uh, and uh, that's why my views and my insight are going to be uh, the point of a politician who is re responsible not only for business development, not only for economy, but it's responsible for the people. Um, and um, well, let, let me just tell you three small uh, sentences at the beginning, and then anyway, we are going to discuss it a little bit further. Um, technological progress is uh, always associated with uh, job losses and job growth on the other side. Since I think the steam engine, uh, this is an ongoing fear uh, of everyone. Uh, we remember that um, uh, just 20 years ago, around 2000, when the computers came in, um, then uh, we were facing the same problem, the automatization. Uh, and then it, we, we could find out that it created a lot of new jobs as well. And I think we are now again in a transformation uh, period. Uh, where I'm optimistic uh, that uh, at the end of the day, mankind is going to win uh, in this technological <clears throat> development. But it doesn't, it's not true for everyone. 
uh, and we have to be responsible for everyone. Um, the last two years of COVID opened tremendous possibility for people. Um, working from home uh, was a huge uh, advantage for a lot of people who had to travel, uh, let's say, miles and miles in order to reach um, their workplace or live in different country. Um, I myself have some friends, women, uh, 30, uh, uh, the end 30, beginning of 40, where they had suddenly a huge um, uh, increase in their salary and their responsibility because even with small children, they could attend international projects. Before that, they had to travel all the time and now you can make it from home. Um, I see how knowledge is spreading, how, let's say, my son is attending uh, a lot of different online um, courses, one from the Columbia, another from the, actually the New York University. And uh, it's really, actually it's quite hard. Uh, but uh, again, I mean, children from all over the world could listen to the best professors um, and even make exams and have their credits for it. So, and if we talk about business that we could really see huge opportunities. But, the other, but on the other hand, I saw a lot of human tragedies. And um, those who were victims of the COVID crisis and not the health crisis, but the economy crisis, uh, were the most vulnerable ones. It's wonderful to work from home if you have a room for everyone separately. Uh, and uh, homeschooling could be very good if you have teachers and IT system which are supporting it. But um, just in a small village of a few uh, kilometers away from Budapest, uh, I saw a group of children, disabled ch uh, children, uh, who just had a terrible loss over the last one and a half year. And one and a half year is a huge time at the age of seven or eight, uh, when you cannot get the same uh, amount of knowledge and because they did not have the money and the, the technical support for that. Uh, so from my point of view, being a um, social democrat, on the other hand, being very responsible for, for the way uh, how the world develops, not just for those who are really uh, the best ones, but for those who are vulnerable and uh, living behind. For me, the most important goal is what I would really like to see is the reduction in the gap between the biggest winners of the next few years and the biggest losers. Um, the introduction of new technology, that it will have winners and losers. And I think it's not only a responsibility of the governments and politicians, it's a, re a responsibility from civil organizations, society, and the business community as well. So that would be my opening remark for to this discussion today. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I, I, I think a great way to open in terms of, uh, first of all, focusing on the experience of people and, and, and recognizing that, that those experiences have been very, very different. Um, and, um, uh, and, and there have been plenty of uh, benefits um, uh, for, for, for some people, but, but also uh, others who, who found things far more, far more challenging. And I, I really liked your, your posing this question about how to narrow the gap between the winners and the losers um, and, and what kind of technology itself, uh, you know, can do to help us um, uh, uh, do that. And, and maybe one of the things that the, 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 uh, the pandemic has taught us is, is, is about the importance of using technology with purpose and, and, and actually um, and that we can apply technology to, to some of these big social, social questions. So lots for us to come back to in, in, the, in the discussion to come. Um, uh, but Carlos, I'd, I'd now like to turn to you um, uh, for, uh, for your perspective um, um, on, on these issues. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Hall. Thank you for the invitation to be part of uh, this event and to participate in the, this so challenging uh, conversation. Uh, I'm, I'm a MEP uh, in ITER committee, uh, also in the Dev Development Committee, and uh, I'm now the, the co-president of the Joint Parliamentary Assembly that links European Union with uh, Africa, uh, Caribbean and Pacific. So uh, my, my perspective is uh, uh, 
combine these uh, these two experiences in development and more technological and energy that I work also. I, I use uh, to be an academic and I try to to link my uh, to to maintain my links with the academy. I'm a full professor in information management in Evora University. And uh, in my 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 first uh, ideas to to share with you, uh, uh, I fully agree with the the the, um, the, the approach that uh, Clara uh, shared with us. But uh, I would try to make a, a little more conceptual uh, some more conceptual approach. I think that uh, uh, we need to and this uh, this perspective includes the interface between the cognitive processes uh, proposed by technology, computers. Uh, uh, iPhones and so on, and the, the emotional competencies that are fundamental for communication and human life. I think that you need to, not only to, to think about uh, uh, bridging the, the gap, uh, not, not to, only uh, to, uh, thinking uh, in access, think is very important, thinking in uh, jobs, in, thinking in the um, skills, but also uh, to, to think about what happens uh, with the people, how people change uh, working, for instance, uh, teleworking or uh, not, not uh, have a possibility to work together or, or, or have the possibility to see what is happening from a city, uh, a capital in, in Africa, what is happening in New York University. This change, uh, change uh, a lot uh, the, the perspective. And I think we need to have a focus, integrated focus on skills, digital literacy, but also in ethics and values in this process. And it also implies uh, that people's imagination and willingness should prevail and for me, this is absolutely important and is my main battle uh, quite, uh, daily uh, and weekly talking with the students and so on in, in Portugal or when I, I can do that. Uh, it implies that the imagination and willingness should prevail over the programs, uh, the applications, the platforms and algorithms. These are tools and you need to maintain that as tools because it could change if uh, we follow the matching and do not have the matching serving us. If uh, an algorithm that uh, is able to uh, um, that uh, that uh, that is 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 able to 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 understand and uh, but not to think and to feel uh, lead the choices, this would be a very, very challenging issue. I, I, I know that you want, I, I have more things to, to share, but during your conversation, you, you can do that. I only want to, to speak uh, about a concrete project I am now working uh, in. Uh, I come from Alentejo. Alentejo is a, a low density, a low density region in Portugal. And uh, uh, you are now trying to, to think how to develop what uh, I call viable uh, economic and social cells uh, to attack people and to retain, to avoid drain brain from these uh, vulnerable regions. Uh, because with the pandemic, with the new opportunities, the new ways to make things happen, uh, you have a lot of people that goes to Alentejo to live, but not to to create to, to create uh, value because they they eat and they drink and so on, but not to to work to the to the territory. And there are a lot of people that are working to the territory outside of the territory. So you have a, a real territory and a virtual territory, a, a real cell and the virtual cells. And to combine that, it's a very strong challenge. And at some time, you, 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 know, you know that you, you have the new generations and the Clara underlined it very, very well. You need to, 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 you need to create a, a, a kind of Erasmus uh, to also to put together the, the new generations of all the world. I, I, my experience, my personal experience is a young Portuguese, when I make my first, it's not Erasmus at the time, the name is Comet, the first opportunity to, and Interred, to know uh, Europe, to bridge and to, 
to, to make the bridge with the different cultures, different perspectives, I change uh, uh, completely my mind. I, I stay prepared to to to, to work in the, to take profit from the platform, and you need also to 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 obtain that with the, the new generations. It's not only uh, now with the, the recovery plans uh, in old Europe, as you know. I think all the governments. Uh, even the, the government in Hungary, Hungary that is very special. But I think all the all the, all the governments uh, will 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 try will try to buy uh, computers to all students to put links and the uh, 5G or strong internet in old houses. But what we need is to connect people and to people feel that is able to connect with others uh, emotionally also with skills, but emotionally also. So I have a lot of things, but uh, I, need, I, I think it's interesting to make uh, in the complement of uh, uh, what Clara told us, and I fully agree to, to, to make this more conceptual approach. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I think you, um, you, you really well illustrated a, 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 what I, I think would be a theme that we should certainly try to, to explore, uh, you know, which is this one of, I suppose, place of, of of places, of communities, of uh, whether they're villages, towns, uh, or high streets, um, uh, you know, I, I think, again, we have this sense of, uh, you know, the pandemic threw up uh, some huge challenges, but also huge opportunities. And again, it feels like there is a chance for some rebalancing um, and uh, that can be in favour of uh, the kind of places and the kind of communities that in the pre-pandemic world uh, really did suffer from that brain drain and did suffer from the uh, uh, the, the eco economic migration to you know the bigger cities and so on. Uh, I myself, I, I grew up in a rural Northumberland in, in the north of England, and and you know, but I live down here in London now. And and um, but I can see you know the communities where, that, that I grew up in, you know, the huge potential uh, for technology to do things differently. So I'd love to come back to that. Um, as, a, as a theme in the discussion a little bit later. Um, I'd also like to just welcome uh, Titi Akin Sanmi, um, who is who has joined us now. Um, and um, uh, very, very much welcome uh, to the conversation. Just to, as a reminder, uh, we're just uh, taking some kind of opening remarks uh, from uh, uh, from the panel, um, and then we'll we'll dig in and explore some of these uh, some of these themes as we go. Uh, but Titi, before I come to you, um, uh, I would like to go to uh, Michael Matlos. Uh, and Michael, for your your, your perspective on, uh, on on the theme today. Okay, thank you very much, Anthony. Uh, uh, hello to everyone. I'm uh, very happy to be here with the with the group and and also with those who are watching. I hope there are a few people watching us. Uh, so I'm uh, I'm president of something called Euroscience, the European Association for the Advancement of Science and Technology. It's a, uh, a pan-European individual member-based association. So in other words, it's, uh, it's research professionals and other types of science professionals who are uh, uh, members of our association on an individual basis, independently of their institutional affiliation or their employer. So these are people who are interested in, uh, in the issues of science in, with, and for society, and in particular, uh, science practice and science policy, issues around ethics, integrity, uh, scientific working conditions. Uh, we're not a labor union. We're more interested in the way science works, the way scientists work, and how scientific careers can be developed, how uh, new uh, scientific practices can be integrated uh, with uh, societal responsibility and uh, with the reflection about the, uh, the needs of society uh, for scientists and what scientists can bring to society and what they can get from society. So uh, th that's, uh, that's what I'm representing here. And our focus uh, in this connection is on the, uh, on the practice, the professional practice of these uh, science professionals and their working conditions and how that's been affected by COVID. Um, one of the things that uh, we did a survey at Euroscience uh, asking researchers on the ground, uh, how, have, how has it been for you uh, under the COVID situation? And uh, it was not a pretty picture. Uh, there was a lot of suffering. Uh, Clara mentioned it, it's not so easy. 
Um, obviously, when things are going well and things are routine, uh, obviously it's not so difficult. But what we found was particularly difficult for the early career researchers, doctoral students uh, who were not able to have regular contact with their doctoral thesis director, uh, young scientists who were not able to have the right social connections to be able to pursue their careers. Um, postdoctoral students who were not able to uh, find the kinds of opportunities that they were looking for to, uh, to move on in their careers, et cetera. And I think what this brings up is uh, also a question, and Clara mentioned the, the, uh, the issues for women. Uh, we found a particularly difficult situation for women uh, regarding the uh, work-life balance. Um, when you are in your office or you're in your laboratory, you are not at home, okay? So the uh, pressure on you, the uh, mental charge, the, uh, the difficulties that you have for managing your home life, your children and all of that can be put aside at least temporarily while you're in a different space. When you're forced to work from home, and Clara, I think, pointed it out very clearly, not everyone has a very large house. Uh, if you have the opportunity, of course, to have a separate room, it's, it's fine. But if you're not, that's, uh, that's going to be an issue. So there were, there were issues there. Um, we saw this uh, COVID pandemic as a, sort of a, a worldwide beta test for uh, remote collaboration. Uh, of course, it wasn't necessarily planned as such. And as Anthony pointed out, many of the developments were also already on their way. They were happening anyway. Uh, I was doing a lot of video conferencing uh, meetings before COVID. So um, I've been working from my home since 2017, so way before COVID. So for me, it was not a COVID effect. But uh, nevertheless, it was a tremendous amplification of the, uh, of the situation. Uh, one thing that uh, everyone noticed, and uh, what's kind of a surprise, is that how well the technology worked. Uh, you know, actually, I think if we had done a survey prior to the COVID pandemic and said, you know, if from between the 15th and 20th of March, 2020, the entire world had to move from physical meetings to remote meetings, would the tech, the tech infrastructure survive? Uh, I think a lot of people would have thought no. And there were no major major problems actually with the, with the technological infrastructure, which came as a big surprise to many, many uh, people and, and many of those in our association. But there are clear limits and those limits uh, are, are evident when you, when you start asking people about how this affected their lives. What you find in general is that working remotely uh, is very efficient for doing what you've always done with those with whom you've always done it. And it makes everything much more efficient for about three months. So you get a tremendous productivity increase for a while. Uh, when that goes on for three years, it becomes a little bit trickier, particularly in areas of uh, my constituency, which is, uh, which is um, uh, scientific, scientific uh, professionals. They're in a creative, uh, innovative, uh, developmental uh, type of uh, professional activity. And so what they are depending on in many cases are physical interactions with people they don't know. Uh, having video conference meetings with people you already know, talking about subjects you already know uh, is fine in the beginning, but it leaves you with a significant negative impact on creativity, new opportunities for personal and business development and, uh, and new uh, areas for collaboration. And so there's a tremendous, tremendous uh, uh, push in our community to go back to physical conference meetings because you need these unexpected encounters. You know, bump into somebody you don't know and realize that that's somebody you should be working with. Uh, if you're planned your meeting uh, on, uh, on Skype, it's gonna be a little hard for you to get, have that unexpected thing unless you have a Zoom bomber or somebody coming in there, but that's gonna be very unusual. So the general issues are, are uh, as pointed out by, uh, by Clara and Carlos and, and others, are the questions, of course, of uh, availability of internet access for the uh, po population, in particular disadvantaged populations, uh, the need to strengthen digital literacy in a general sense. These are issues for democracy, and there are also issues for uh, societal cohesion. Uh, Work-life balance, I think, on all levels needs to be taken into account. Uh, what I think we should not forget, though, is that there have been some tremendous opportunities also with this digital uh, technology, and uh, one of those is uh, 
is that in many, many places, there is sufficient access to the digital technologies for uh, significant uh, support from these technologies to disadvantaged communities. Um, one thing that's happening right now, as you probably know, there are a number of universities in Eastern Europe that are currently providing support to our friends and colleagues in Ukraine on a digital basis to allow students and professors to continue working in Ukrainian universities without having to leave the country of Ukraine. And this is something that is only possible uh, with these digital uh, platforms. And so that's something that's very, very positive. Uh, I have a personal experience myself with something interesting in uh, where I work. Uh, uh, though you don't notice that from my accent, but I work in France. Uh, I'm a professor of chemical engineering in France, but I'm actually a dual citizen, both uh, French and uh, American. So uh, uh, my English is, tends to be uh, the American colonial accent that Anthony probably finds very amusing. But uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, what I'm doing, one of the things that I'm doing in France is I'm working with a uh, partnership foundation on the, the use of digital technologies in higher education. And uh, we put in place a platform to help those students who have not completed their secondary education to go through the training to be able to be admitted to French universities. And this is uh, uh, in particular important to people who are far away, this goes back to what Carlos was saying, far away from university centers. They don't have the possibility to travel. And so they can use this interface. And one of the very, very interesting applications that we found for that technology was working with the uh, administration of prisons in France. And if there is one population that has a hard time moving to a university center, it is absolutely someone who's in prison. It is, in fact, illegal for them to leave the prison to go to, co to coursework. So uh, obviously, putting at their disposal the possibility to be connected uh, through digital technology is a tremendous opportunity for progress. Uh, um, in, um, in conclusion, I would say that this is a mixed bag. Uh, there are clearly challenges. Uh, there are clearly difficulties. We do need the physical part of it. Uh, for many, many reasons. But at the same time, there are wonderful opportunities and things that we can do to help disadvantaged populations. Uh, there are also questions about uh, the infrastructures and the way we manage and govern the infrastructures. And we might want to come back to that later on. So that's, uh, those are my initial remarks. So uh, I'll give you back to the floor, uh, Anthony. Thank you very much, Michael. And uh, yeah, I think challenges and opportunities absolutely sums it up. And, and uh, I think it, as we go into the discussion, really focusing in on those opportunities bits, I think is, is going to be really important because, I mean, it really strikes me that, um, you know, as we went into the co period of COVID lockdowns, um, we became incredibly um, kind of flexible in our ability to think differently about how we could do things. Um, but in a way, now that we've, we've kind of got used now to, to that, that new way of doing things, it's, it, you know, and that's sort of become quite en entrenched in a way over two years. And it seems to me that as we enter this um, kind of post-COVID period, uh, you know, we need to do that, that, we need that flexibility again to think about how do we do things differently in this more hybrid world where we can um, maintain some of the benefits that we, that, that we did uh, see, uh, uh, you know, through this kind of, as you said, this, this, this massive sort of beta uh, uh, test for remote collaboration and so on. Uh, but but also how we can apply some of these um, uh, some of these technologies to maybe to address some of, some of the old entrenched problems. Um, I would like now like to um, go to uh, Titi Akinsamni uh, from Google um, um, and really to get your your perspective and, and in particular really interesting to get your your perspective of uh, from a, you know, with Google working in Africa and 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 maybe. Um, you know, that, that, that kind of looking beyond Europe's borders, as it were, to, to get that kind of broader reflection on, on uh, the global phenomenon uh, that has been uh, this, this COVID pandemic. All right, thank you very much, Anthony. Michael, Carlos and Clara, good to meet all of you. Um, I wanted to be able to share this real quick that one of the values that we've found or the value adds we've seen and we've had with uh, being able to work remotely and using technology is that literally between when I signed on and when I'm speaking right now, I have changed location twice. Um, hopefully it's been, a, it's been relatively seamless 
um, but certainly does mean that there's going to be certain changes um, in the way we all engage going forward. Um, a couple of things. Um, yes, when we signed up for this, um, this summit initially, it was 2020, correct? Um, and in 2020, I was indeed the lead for government affairs and public policy for Google across West Africa. Since then, however, my role has changed significantly. I now lead on the global, the global team that develops policy um, for all our hardware and assistant as well. What does that then mean? It means that even though I am sitting in a completely different location, I can still work with my team that is sitting globally. And that could only be possible based on the kind of technologies that were already in place. A couple of things I want to be able to say. Um, I like to say that the world has finally caught up with me. The conversation we're having today is in no way representation of Google. If anything is said that is not okay, please attribute it to me, not to my employer. Um, two, um, I would love to be able to say that, Michael, you've been doing remote things since 2017. I've been doing it since 2002, when I first got my job remotely in Johannesburg, South Africa. And I was consistently making the case for the adoption and the use of information and communications technologies, which was the go-to phrase then, right? ICTs for development. And a lot of that was informed by this, the knowledge that we were gradually or even maybe a bit faster now. We were historically gradually, but now really rapidly getting to a point where technology is such an intricate part, an intrinsic part of everything that we do. And I recognized early on that if we do not adopt technology, if we don't make use of technology, if we don't have the right skill sets in place, if we don't have the right sets of policies enabling innovation, but then also providing the right kind of environment for technology to be adopted and in use by everyone globally, we potentially might find ourselves in a place where we almost did, not my words, almost did in 2020. March 13, 2020, I was on a work trip in Johannesburg, South Africa, and I heard through the grapevine that the borders were going to be closed. I immediately knew, okay, likely this was going to happen, but a lot of people were skeptical. Borders will not be closed. The world will not come to a standstill. I recall requested meetings with a range of key opinion formers, be they government, academics, and I'd say, could we meet remotely? And they would go, no, absolutely not. We need to be able to meet face to face. Nothing against face to face. However, over the last two years, consistently, engagements have, I don't want to say 10x, have become, it's become the norm for us to have conversations like this. And there has been many advantages to it. It has meant that people have had to reshape the way they think. It has meant that people have had to reshape the way they communicate, where historically our conversations would be very much driven by, you know, ability to be able to read the room, quote and unquote. Now you've got to be able to read humans who you really don't know if they're fully dressed for the meeting or not. I got dressed up for this meeting, right? Now, on the other side is then all of a sudden we had um, technology in place that ranged from Zoom to Meet, et cetera, that had been developed historically, but was not necessarily prepared for the mass adoption that was coming into place. So mass adoption is happening. It means the technology needed to catch up for the very first time in a long time, right? with the use cases that were in place. It meant that we needed to be able to 10X our ability to ensure conversations were happening in secure manners. I'm sure all of you are immediately thinking about all the Zoom fails that you can recall. And unfortunately, it was Zoom that was sitting right at the front of that conversation. Best, easiest in terms of adoption, please do not quote me to my, my employer. However, they were ill-prepared when it came to the security part of it. So what began to throw up over the last two years was the end user increasingly became more conscious of their rights, right? Of their privacy, they became more conscious of, okay, what technology works best, what would not? And a lot of that began to have impact also on socials. I'll give you another example of how I am a very much an early adapter. My first child is going to be 10. It took me a long time to be responsible for human life in general. So I had her in my mid to late 30s. I have three now. And my first child's naming ceremony, you know, when you get my family together and you give the child a name, happened over Google Meet in 2012. 
But with the co with COVID coming up, all of a sudden we had weddings and we had you know social gathering, Thanksgiving, Christmas, etc., happening over these tools that were primarily developed for the formal economic sector, not for social gatherings. So all of a sudden we had to have a lot of adjustments happening in the way we could actually engage. People wanted to be able to express surprise. There was a need for more emojis. On the one hand, let me switch real quick because I know Carlos is also an academic. All of a sudden we needed to take exams online. You needed to be able to do a PhD defense or one or the other thing consistently online. How do you ensure people stay through to the rigor of not quote unquote cheating, right? When you are not in the same room with them. It's the same question marks that employers then immediately have. How do you ensure the employees actually at work quote unquote when they say they are at work? So for me, in terms of introductory remarks, these are a few of the things that has been thrown up. There's a whole lot more that came with an institution like Google all of a sudden, yes, being prepared as a technology firm, but then having to become prepared, particularly for the social aspect. Thank you very much. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, as, a, as an organization that works with um, with pretty much the full range of big technology companies, uh, what we saw was companies that uh, were able to pivot incredibly quickly um, to the reality of, of that um, uh, uh, kind of remote online world. But 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 actually, as Titi said, uh, you know, it, suddenly there were these new challenges that were thrown up, um, and you know, where technologies uh, that may have you know previously been planned for quite a, a small niche audience were suddenly becoming mass technologies that were used by everybody. Um, and, uh, and 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 how quickly companies had to respond to that, which was uh, which was really fascinating. Um, I'd like now um, um, like to turn to uh, Aaron uh, Sundarajan um, uh, in New York. Uh, thank you for being very patiently kind of listening into everybody else. Um, and uh, Aaron, I, I wonder if whether you've got this all sorted for us. Have you got all the answers for for how we can uh, optimize these benefits and and and. Uh, and uh, cast off some of the challenges? Well, um, I, I, I don't have all the answers, but I do have a slide which, um, which I prepared. So I'm gonna, um, <clears throat> I'm gonna share the slide, um, being the business school professor that I am. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, this, this, is, this has been a really fascinating conversation so far. Um, I hope you guys can see my slide and not others, not some other sort of unintended part of my screen. Okay, which has happened um, during remote teaching. Um, but the, um, you know, the, the expectation that we all had a couple of years ago was that the onset of COVID was going to change things, but more specifically that it was going to accelerate ongoing change because this is what this kind of large shock crisis, World War II, um, like, you know, sort of the financial crisis did, not necessarily only in the creation of new technologies that, um, you know, sort of are built to respond to the crisis, um, but in sort of changing, like, you know, the economic, social, and other factors that um, alter the pace at which ongoing change, um, like, you know, progresses. And we certainly saw that, for example, with remote work, um, with flexible work, with, um, you know, online education, online healthcare. Um, and I thought I'd take each of the three elements of our um, working, living, and bridging the digital divide, um, like, you know, sort of in turn, um, and spend a couple of minutes on them. Um, you know, I always have thought of um, flexibility in work as being along two dimensions, time and space. Um, you might be able to do your work at a different point in time, um, or you may be able to do it in a different place. And so a healthcare worker Typically, a frontline healthcare worker might be able to have some flexibility in time, but probably not in space. Fast food worker can't change time and space for the most part. An Uber driver has a lot of flexibility in time, but pretty much has to be, you know, behind the wheel of their car, you know, in terms of space. Um, lawyers and sort of like, you know, Wall Street traders can often change their space, but not their time. Um, and software engineers can often change both, like, you know, time and space. 
And I, I, I think that we saw this sort of shock to, um, you know, the space aspect very dramatically during COVID. And I expect that we will continue to see some persistence in the remote work culture that we've created. Um, but, you know, um, I think that this will have a couple of implications and, um, you know, many of my co-panelists have raised these issues already. Um, you know, a new digital divide on both, um, like, you know, the, uh, on the income front, certainly, um, certain people have a lot more space flexibility than others. These tend to be higher income workers. And so they get sort of like, you know, that digital divide and flexibility grows on the income front, certainly a different kind of digital divide is created when, you know, depending on your family role, the amount of flexibility that you can, in fact, like, you know, bring into, like, you know, being in a different space. And um, like, you know, Clara pointed these out sort of very well. Um, and both Tiri and Michael have pointed out new adjustment challenges as we, you know, recognize the deficiencies of digital interaction. Um, you know, I, 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 you know, I, I think that, you know, we've seen it most saliently in the formation of new professional ties and interactions. And I think this goes to Michael's point of um, his research finding that um, you know, if you were doing the same thing with the same people, things worked very well. Um, but, you know, if you have to create new ties or form new interactions, we are recognizing that, um, you know, digital interfaces have, you know, certain deficiencies. Um, I've also seen it accelerate the adoption of non-employment work arrangements, because if you add time and space flexibility, um, then the rationale for full-time employment starts to weaken even further. And um, what this leads to is, um, you know, I mean, this certainly will happen and is happening. Um, the challenges that this uh, poses is in the fact that in a number of our countries, the safety net has been set up for full-time employees and is funded in part by the full-time employer. This is particularly true in the US and UK, perhaps less so in um, other Western European countries, certainly true in Japan as well. And so those challenges to the safety net that we already saw sort of unfold over, you know, the decade preceding COVID are only more stark as more and more people are in work arrangements that don't qualify them for a safety net and, um, you know, an often overlooked challenge of non-employment work arrangements are the community challenges. Um, Anthony brought this up earlier in terms of sort of differential impacts across different real world communities. But I think uh, sort of a, a hidden and sort of related challenge as we move into these new worlds of work is that in many countries, the primary community organization is the workplace. Um, it's not the church anymore. It's not the Rotary Club anymore. It's not sort of the knitting club anymore. It's the workplace. And if you take that out of the equation, it's not just that you lose those sort of serendipitous interactions that are important for professional life, but you lose sort of like, you know, the physical world space in which you created these connections to other human beings outside of like, you know, the immediate professional context. And Zoom has certainly not helped us like, you know, so, you know, we've had Zoom happy hours and we've had, you know, I've, I've seen every single um, technological innovation to try and facilitate, you know, um, casual social interaction. And, you know, all they've done is sort of highlight the fact that there is really no substitute um, for physical world interaction. Um, so for all the talk of the metaverse and like, you know, the rebranding of Facebook as meta, I think that we are still very early in the evolution of digital as a substitute for physical world interaction. I mean, we live in a low bandwidth metaverse already. Um, some people like, you know, sort of active gamers live at a higher bandwidth metaverse. Um, but the real opportunity I see, and I didn't see any sort of significant acceleration due to COVID um, in this space, but the opportunities will come less from creating brand new metaverse spaces but in connecting the existing spaces, we have more with like, you know, sort of real world interaction. Um, with the digital divide, and I'll sort of stop after this, um, you know, I have always maintained that we measure inequality wrong. Um, we've measured inequality in terms of income and wealth inequality. And I, I, I don't sort of dispute those measures 
as being valid measures, um, but they're narrow. Um, they measure two things that are very important, but they don't measure a whole bunch of other effects of digital technology. You know, I look at the impact that digital has had on, you know, different measures of access to a higher standard of living, you know, access to communications technology. And when I was a kid, there were three telephones in our neighborhood and um, you had to sort of go to someone's house if you wanted to make a phone call. Um, you go, and this was in India, in an urban part of India, but you go to that same urban part of India now and everybody has a phone. Um, and so inequality and access to communication technology has dropped dramatically because of digital technology. Inequality and access to streaming entertainment has dropped dramatically over the last 30 years because of digital technology. And I think one of the things that COVID has done is that it accelerated the extension of digital into the physical world, right? Not just in terms of how we work, um, which expands opportunities for people who live in countries where there isn't so much opportunity, but it expands access to education and healthcare. I think there was a hundredfold increase in the NYU medical system in the use of telemedicine in like, you know, the first week um, after the COVID lockdown. And a tremendous amount of that has persisted. What this means is that the digital channel for delivery of healthcare is, has become more mainstream. And we can see a similar inequality reduction in access to healthcare as it becomes more digital um, in the same way that we've seen for communication, for the delivery of digital, you know, sort of products like communication and uh, entertainment. And we saw massive strides forward in the delivery of digital education because of the shock. And I think the long run effect of this will be reducing inequality and access to education. I mean, as Carlos has pointed out, we do have to be vigilant about new forms of, um, you know, um, algorithmic bias. But I think equally importantly, we have to change our metrics of inequality. Um, I do also see promises and peril in like, you know, sort of the new world of Web3, but I think I'll stop there. Um, leave that for the discussion point since I'm out of my seven minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aaron. I, I think you um, you really kind of pulled all the threads together um, of the conversation uh, uh, really succinctly there. So, so thank, thank you. Know, you. And what was what's beautiful about this panel and serendipitous is that I didn't change a word on my slides as you guys were talking. I mean, it just sort of it just happened that way. So, excellent, excellent. So, um, well, I mean, I mean the. So in terms of kind of themes that came through for me, um, I mean, it, I, I felt like uh, there was a big focus on, 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 you know, on the impact on people um, and, uh, uh, and, and people's lives. Uh, there's there's a big piece, I think, on, on the impact on places um, and, and some of the challenges that I think we now face um, just in terms of, uh, uh, you know, the shift in where people are and where they're spending their money and, and, and kind of what this means for communities and places and things. I think there is um, there's there's something about the impact on organisations and their their ability to function as uh, uh, as kind of social entities um, that, that that can all also kind of foster things like uh, you know creativity and and, and innovation. Um, you know, to, to Michael's point, um, and then I think there's this broad point about the kind of um, you know the the kind of societal impact in terms of uh, you know these key things about access to uh, to education, to healthcare, um, and to um, and and also this kind of this point about knitting together and 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 and, and actual you know this, this fact that you know we need these sort of social places and social spaces in order to sort of knit, knit our society together. Um, I would let's 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 start with the people one um, because I think uh, as as Clara kind of made you know very very uh, set up very very clearly I think. Uh, you know, it's very, it, it's kind of, it's very apparent that that, that um, there have been um, uh, kind of uh, winners and losers in, in terms of um, uh, the the you know the 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 impact of this remote working um, on on um, on people. Um, uh, I think it, it it's and it, but but very often it, it you know it's very very much linked to uh, you know. A, existing inequalities um, and uh, you know uh, more 
uh, educated, wealthy, middle class people working from laptops and living in big houses, you know, were, were, you know, it was a relatively seamless and painless transition. Uh, but if you uh, uh, didn't have those kind of privileges or you're crucially at your early stages of a career where you really do depend on, 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 uh, 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 on that kind of social interaction, I think it was much more difficult way, you, you know, you might be, you know, students sharing a, a small apartment or something. Um, and then there's this very specific kind of gender point as well in terms of, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the impact on women uh, in, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, who we know um, still uh, carry too much of the burden of childcare, um, but where there were kind of, you know, they, they felt both advantages and disadvantages, you know, the advantages of, of, of uh, perhaps uh, uh, things happening more remotely that they could manage and fit into their life. But also they had the challenge of dealing with childcare, particularly when schools were closed and things, um, which was extraordinary challenge. Um, so I suppose my question is, how do we begin to uh, seize upon some of these benefits, but also focus in on on making sure that we don't we're not creating new long term uh, challenges and, and inequalities. And Clara, I can see you're you're dying to get in, so <coughs> kicks off, kicks off. Yes, because I, I think that we touched upon a quite important issues, and for a politician, there are some decisions we are, which I would say, so so obvious. What do we have to do? I mean, we have the digital education. Uh, action plan. We have the European skills agenda in order to increase uh, the digital level in education. We have different social programs for uh, disabled people or even those who are uh, vulnerable people. We have now a proposal for uh, changing the labor right in order to have the right to disconnect uh, uh, and to see this kind of absolutely different parameters of home working uh, than those who were working on the band uh, uh, eight hours. So these are so to say obvious uh, answers, uh, well, of course, sometimes we fail, sometimes we give good answers, but this seems to be so obvious. But let me put you another question, let's so to say to the address. Um, before the COVID, so it's even not this kind of quick transition, uh, what we have seen in the last two years. Before the COVID, we have made a survey, uh, actually, I think it was Europe and North America as well, about populism, about extremism. What's the reason uh, why people turned in the right in the last uh, uh, few years, so let's say decades, uh, quite a lot uh, towards different populistic or extremistic political um, uh, thoughts? And of course, there were some answers which we would say they are natural, linking to the economical situation, to uh, what kind of prospects they have to like, educational things and so on. But there was a very strong uh, attitude, it, and it was, uh, how should I formulate, it was stability. That we thought that the 20th century was a very quick century, that suddenly technology came into our life at home with the washing machine and the dryer and the cars and whatever. Um, and the 21st century seems to be even more quicker, which it's not only on our home, but it's in our hands, in our minds, uh, and we have to adapt all the time. I mean, come on, I have to update my software on my telephone every month and then I have to learn the buttons from the beginning and, and where they are. Uh, and it, it creates an ongoing tension in a lot of people. Um, I was working with, in, in development policy all my life and I remember, let's say 30 years ago, 25 years ago when I was young and going to the people and saying, come on, lifelong learning, what a wonderful opportunity. And I think all of us here are willing to learn until they are 80 or 85. And, and I was shocked when I first met a person who was at that time 50 years old. It seemed to me very old at that time. Now I am 50 years old, so I don't know know what I was thinking at that time uh, and he told me I don't want to learn anymore I would like to have I mean I was learning all my life and I would like a stability and a security with my knowledge that I know what I have to do and and I should know it in one year and two years and I was shocked oh come on and it seems that we have to give somehow and we were talking about um, emotional Carlos you told that we have to deal with the emotional side of this very rapid changes. And when they are rapid, it means in months they are changing. We have to deal with the emotional side of these changes. It's not simply, 
what kind of education you have, but what is your attitude towards uh, change? And it's, it's not a good answer to say, I'm not dealing with people who do not want to learn every month something new. We have to give them somehow a security. I wouldn't say slow down because I mean, digital technology and change of the world is like summer is coming and the sun is going up uh, in the morning, but we definitely have to have an answer uh, to the people um, emotionally that they should feel secure in this new kind of world. Fascinating, fascinating point. Um, and uh, so I'd like to open that to, 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 to the rest of the panel. Is, is there a way that we can, we can reassure people and give them more, uh, more, more, I suppose, confidence and kind of allow them to be calmer in a way and feel calmer in this kind of uh, fast changing world? Who would like to come in? And uh, if I can, uh, I, I will uh, also share some ideas about the territorial impacts. But uh, before, I think it's very important to underline what uh, Clara told us, because uh, we uh, usually we look to the to the new infrastructures, to the new technologies, as a big opportunity, and it's really a big opportunity of of change. But in same time, in same networks, uh, there are a lot of disinformation. At the same time, in the same platforms, there are a lot of uh, uh, manipulation. And uh, we need to be prepared uh, that the big battle that is announced between the democracy, human rights, and authoritarianism, and uh, other, other, other perspectives, we will be a battle in the networks. And, this uh, is a battle which weapons are not only skills and infrastructure, are uh, culture, emotional, ethics. Uh, it's really very important. Another thing that I want also to share with you is uh, how the, 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 new, the, the new way of life that, for instance, uh, TT explains us so, uh, in a way so interesting uh, undermine the quality of decision. The quality of decision in the organizations, the quality of decision in the United Nations, the quality of decision in the Russian government, the quality of decision in the European Parliament. Let me talk uh, a little about the, the, my experience in the European Parliament. In the European Parliament during two years, we, uh, be, we decide not face-to-face, uh, -face, but online. And what I feel is that it's easiest to agree online. Because online, you, are, uh, you have one hour a meeting, we need to, to have conclusions. Uh, you, you only see one part of the, we see exactly the, the, the PowerPoint or the, the, the phrase that is in the, in the screen. But after the deal, the deal is not so strong. The deal is not so good. The deal is not so deep. The deal is not so, Trustable. Uh, I think that this example in the European Parliament could be perhaps uh, study in uh, about the quality of uh, that uh, Michael uh, told us of the uh, distance learning only. Uh, I have the, the story in my uh, my my university is in Evora. Evora is a world heritage city, very beautiful city. It's my promotion, <laughs> but you have a lot of students that come from uh, from Brazil, for instance, it's Portuguese the language, Portuguese university, and uh, sometimes they they told us, but we come from uh, to study in a beautiful city, as they have a beautiful city, but to have uh, to have uh, online classes in the monuments of Evora, this is uh, is something that is also uh, important to understand. Uh, now, uh, I, I will uh, say something about the, the territorial impact. W when I, uh, I, I talk about viable economic and social cells, I'm talking about that uh, it's, uh, uh, some people uh, follow and some governments and some decisions, uh, uh, decision takers follow uh, uh, thinking that now uh, you will make the same things the same processes, the same procedures, the same routines, uh, without the uh, distance barriers, without uh, more more quickly. But it's not that. It, it's it's a complete 
reinvention. Because if, for instance, uh, in my region, Alentejo, <laughs> in the, the work you are doing now with a, uh, an European project to, infer, to give uh, better infrastructure, to give uh, computers, to give all, all these to the, in the region, to have a pilot project in the region. Uh, but the people that uh, need to have, as Aaron told us, is the metaverse. You need also to care. The essential thing will be the connection between the real and the virtual. The, the, the most important thing will be that we could have access to wealth online, but we need to have proximity, services, hospitals in proximity. You could have st study abroad online, but you need to have also schools of proximity. And you need also to have critical mass uh, people uh, uh, that could meet in a restaurant, or could meet in a club to have a beer or to, to see, for instance, if I, I, I have not able to have in my city uh, enough member of very qualified people that come from England, from India, from South Africa, or from Angola, that are supporters of uh, Manchester United and go together, a number that go together to see the match, it's not possible to fix them. This is the critic mass. I need to have 10 supporters of, of Manchester United and 10 supporters of uh, Borussia Dortmund, something like that. And uh, I think this is very important. Uh, 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 another example, and the uh, last one, uh, you can follow, but you have yet uh, even one hour to discuss. But another example, it's uh, you need also to to look to the opportunity of the opportunity. What it means to change all, all that, uh, we need a lot of uh, uh, new enterprises, of new software, of new uh, uh, infrastructure, of new. Uh, to, you need to build it, and sometimes when we uh, build the infrastructure, you can change. Uh, the uh, the game from some regions. For instance, also in my region, in Alentejo, Portugal, you have a deep port, deep water port, this port of Sines. Port of Sines is an important port of uh, uh, goods, also energy, traditional energy. But now, in Sines, Sines is linked by two uh, submarine data cables. One is from Google, Ekeno, you pass through Sinus and go to Africa. And the other is from a corporation with a lot of uh, uh, investors, including the, 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 the European Union uh, to science data that links uh, South America, is the first cable that links South America directly to uh, Europe and after also to uh, South, South of Africa and Asia. So in a moment, Sinus, that is a place with a lot of sun, have also a lot of data. And sun and data with hydrogen means that a lot of enterprises now are buying uh, places in Sinus. This is also a change that is a change of structure of reinvention. But you have no people prepared and skilled in Sinus in to, 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 to take the profit of that. You need to attract people that like Manchester United and they have good bars and good beer to see the game. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I talk about Manchester United, but my team is sporting Lisbon, okay? <laughs> but um, I, I mean, I, I think it's, it's really fascinating because you're, in, in a way, um, the, the question that keeps kind of coming in my mind is, is, um, is, is, is how, you know, how and who is going to seize this opportunity to drive this positive change? Because um, it, there will be, you know, for, for a lot of people, I think there'll be a sense of, well, can we not just go back to the way it was because the back to the way it was worked quite well. And then there will be other people who are like, I like this new way of working. It suits me. I want to stick with what, what I have. Um, and, 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 and then also in terms of the way in which decisions are made, whether it's by companies or by uh, local authorities or governments um, or institutions, you know, the, there is um, 
will they go back to old ways of making decisions or are are we going to uh you know kind of you know seize this opportunity to to reinvent and and, and create the new um aaron i'd be interested in your your perspective on that in terms of you know are we sort of mentally equipped in a way both individually and as as organizations to to um to recognize the opportunity here to do things differently or the need to you know to do things differently um <clears throat> well i i think we're much better equipped mentally today than we were two years ago um if there's uh if there's one thing that um covid has done it has sort of significantly improved our ability to adjust to new interaction environments um, and so I, I think that eventually the question is going to come down less to preparedness and more to um, like, you know, sort of where do we want to take the future of work and the future of interaction? Because, um, you know, a, um, you know, we, we, I, I, I guess the, um, you know, the, the, the technocentric sort of nature of um, the conversation over the last 25 or so years, um, sort of through like, you know, the emergence of the commercial internet, the dot-com boom, and like, you know, what has transpired in the two decades after, has made a lot of people <clears throat> sort of susceptible to this fallacy of technological determinism, right? Which is the idea that if you build it, they will come. You know, if you sort of create the technology, and we're seeing it happen with decentralizing blockchain technology, just because the technology can decentralize doesn't mean that it's going to, right? I mean, the political, the economic, the social um, environment, just because AI can increase inequality doesn't mean it's going to or reduce. Yeah. It's not really the technology that determines the outcome. And and you, you, you see that in... Um, you know, like the possibility of a wide variety of new forms of interaction and work and so on have been created and, you know, sort of proven with COVID. But that doesn't necessarily mean that that's where we're going to take things. And so it's less about, for me, the mindset of can I cope with this new sort of digital world and more about like, you know, sort of where will we collectively take the technological possibilities? Will we take them to a place where, you know, there's sort of a good balance between um, physical world interaction and online interaction? Um, or like, you know, it seems like we have taken a significant fraction of social interaction into a sort of a low bandwidth text message exchange world sort of permanently. You know, that technology has been around for 25 odd years. It's been on our mobile phones for 15 years. Um, and much better technologies have come along for digital interaction. Um, but we haven't really embraced them. I mean, this is the one, this is the place where we seem to have landed, where we're interacting with people in physical space. And then we've sort of got this low bandwidth interaction with with, with, with others sort of in digital space. It seems like we like occasional asynchronous interaction with people who are remote um, through like, you know, social media posts. Like, you know, we don't engage in sort of active, high bandwidth, constant communication with them. You know, in many ways, it's sort of a relief to have to, you know, you, you, you've got this sort of, um, you know, maybe there was an unmet need for like, you know, sort of non-interactive, keeping in touch with relatives. <laughs> that you go for Christmas dinner, but you can just sort of like their Facebook photographs and feel like you've, and so that, that was a need that was met by the technology. And so, yeah, so that's, that's sort of what I'm trying to figure out. I mean, where are we going to take this rather than are we prepared for the new technology? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it does absolutely feel like, um, you know, I've, I've, you know, in terms of tech determinism, determinism you know, I've, I've always taken the view that actually technology is all about choices and it's all about the choices that we make uh, as individuals, as organizations, as a communities and, and, and society. And, um, and, and uh, but that, that also requires some imagination and some creativity, right? In terms of uh, thinking about a different kind of future. 
Um, and I mean, in a way, if you look across society, you know, the, the kind of organizations that have, that have done that in a way most more effectively um, over the last 20 years has, has been the sort of, you know, the tech startup, you know, uh, you know, you get a small group of people together with an idea and you, um, you know, raise a lot of funding to kind of invest in it and you build it in something. And, um, and, and a lot of the changes that we've experienced as, as employees or workers or citizens have, have come out of that kind of community. I suppose my question is, is can, um, uh, but, but, you know, to, to, to Carlos's point, you know, some of the opportunities are on a bigger scale, um, you know, that they need to be driven by governments, by local authorities, uh, by kind of communities coming together. Um, and I, I'm interested in, in a way, how optimistic you are about, about the potential for that, you know, for, for that to happen. Um, uh, you know, in a way, who are the, who are going to be the, who, who's, who is out there seeing the opportunity and who is able to, to kind of help shape that, that, that opportunity? Yeah, it's, 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 it's a tough one because, um, you know, I think the, um, you know, we have progressively over the last 15 or so years handed over more and more of the job of you know, sort of being the central authority that organizes and designs society um, from like, you know, sort of governments and community organizations to digital platforms. This has sort of happened de facto, right? I mean, it wasn't like, you know, we all got together and said, let's yeah. sort of change the social contract. It just sort of happened. And, um, and you know, they, 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 you know, our censorship, our surveillance, our, um, you know, currencies now, um, like, you know, sort of maintaining law and order, um, like intellectual property rights divisions, all of these things are more and more governed by digital platforms. And so there's sort of a design that's being put in place that we haven't thought through carefully. Um, and, you know, the, the point I'm getting to is that I'm, I'm not hugely optimistic that a government is going to step forward and say, well, here are the opportunities and this is the imprint that we're going to put in place to sort of create social interactions or societal sort of balance in this way. Um, like governments seem to have moved into this reactive mode um, where change happens, the design is flawed, and then they say, okay, like, you know, what do we do about it? Um, how do we, how do, how, how, how do we, um, how do we correct it? And so the force that I think is gonna be pushing, um, like, you know, sort of the new design forward um, are going to be sort of the existing and emerging digital platforms. And uh, the rest of societal stakeholders seem to either be playing catch up or looking for ways. I mean, China may be an exception here, um, but in pretty much every other country, it's going to be in like, you know, sort of trying to make the best of a flawed design rather than um, like, you know, sort of being proactive and saying this is the way we want the world to look. I mean, I. I, I remember in a conversation like six or seven years ago with one of the founders of Airbnb, Brian Chesky, who was a, um, you know, unlike a lot of the other sort of successful tech entrepreneurs of the last 20 years, he's not a banker or computer scientist. He, he went to the Rhode Island School of Design. So he thinks of the world in design. And, you know, he said this thing that's always sort of stayed with me, which is like, you know, um, you got to design the world you want to live in because um, if you don't design it, someone else will design it for you. Yeah. And then you may not like the world that you end up with. And, <clears throat> you know, I, I sort of keep going back to that, like, you know, sort of every time there's this sort of a blow up on something that is wrong with the world because of the platform, then they're like, hey, we didn't design the world that we wanted. And so someone has designed it for us. That's a, that's a great point. Michael, I wanted to bring you in on, um, uh, you know, how, how your, your community, in a way, is, you know, and particularly researchers and younger researchers and younger scientists, you know, how, how you think they will, and you, you know, you talked about how they were directly impacted by, by, by the pandemic, but, I, but I'm interested in how you think it may influence or shape the way they will go about science and, and, and you know, really, uh, you know, the, the kind of exploration that they do um, and their, their uh, you know you know will will we have a generation of of young younger scientists and researchers who who actually work in a slightly different way just because 
they've started to work differently or is academia sort of so rigid that it's going to force them back into you know doing things exactly as uh, as their professors used to do it uh thanks uh anthony well you know one of the problems with rigid systems is that they're very fragile because they, they they're not uh, they're not able to bend they just break okay so one of the problems in in a very general sense if i can talk about that segment of uh, my constituency if you will which is the academic research community we we did something last year with euroscience we organized our first euroscience policy forum which is an online an online event similar to the one that we're currently doing right now and we entitled the, uh, the event uh, Sustainable Academia. And the reason for that was the question that we're asking ourselves is, is the academic system, the way it was created starting with uh, Humboldt in the, uh, in the 19th century and going forward through the 20th century, the creation of an academic community, which is known in the Western world uh, to be a, a sort of a, a certain kind of organization uh, of, uh, of uh, academic actors, is, is that really something which is going to survive? And, uh, and uh, if you think about it, uh, which of course academic people don't usually do because they're <laughs> convinced that uh, they will survive, but uh, if you think about it with a little bit of distance, you realize that there are some reasons to doubt that that is going to be possible. And uh, this comes from uh, a number of factors that are not directly related to the subject of this uh, particular uh, uh, discussion, but related to increasing societal demands on the uh, intellectual community. Uh, basically saying we would like to instrumentalize uh, knowledge creation. Uh, th this is a very, very present, uh, I mean, I'm sure, uh, you know, if you look in the UK, the research councils in the UK are, are funding essentially very objective oriented uh, stuff. I, I mean, uh, I'm the former head of a research funding agency. Uh, I, you know, I, you tend to, particularly Europe is the worst because they only fund basically with the exception of the European Research Council, they only fund objective driven uh, research uh, orientations. And this is, um, this means that there may not be any place left in the next uh, 10 or 20 years for uh, what we would call fully open uh, academic, uh, academic research. So that's one issue. An issue that's more directly related though to the discussion here today, and which comes back to something that Aaron mentioned, is are we being essentially driven by the platforms? Um, and this has to do with a, a very, very uh, important issue currently in the academic research community regarding uh, data protection, data security, and data sharing. Um, if you go back in time uh, and think about what happened over the 20th century, the 20th century created an academic community in most of the Western world, which moved from a, a situation in the late 19th century, which is essentially philanthropic, support, you know, sort of enlightened amateurs that were doing things and then uh, with some money because they had wealthy, you know, wealthy philanthropists who were giving them money. And we moved from that through the military industrial complex through the end of the 20th century, where practically all of the fundamental research going on in academia is publicly funded. And this has an association with a concept which is somehow being lost in the current uh, discussions which is the notion of universal public goods. And we saw it with the COVID. If you think about the COVID virus, the, uh, the uh, genetic sequence of the COVID virus was, was identified relatively quickly in early uh, 2020, and it was shared internationally with the entire uh, scientific community, both public and private, for free. Yeah. Uh, that is what we, in, what we mean by universal public goods, is that things that are created through public uh, funding of purely fundamental research should be available to everyone. And this is where the connection is with what Aaron was saying about the digital platforms is, where is that information being stored? Uh, it's being stored on digital platforms. It's not being stored in libraries. 
of public universities. And in many cases, there are paywalls uh, to get into that information, even though that information should be publicly available to, uh, to anyone. And so if we come back to our topic for today, we talk about the digital divide. If you think about a sector such as uh, fundamental research, uh, there is a digital divide between those who have access to the uh, data sharing platforms with sufficient infrastructure and sufficient availability and those who do not. And this can happen inside of even of a single uh, nation state. You can have uh, universities that are able to have access to these things and others that are not. And I think we have to be careful there. And I think one of the, uh, one of the impacts that we should be keeping in mind is this, this whole question about how open is our open data basically. Uh, and it seems to me that there are, uh, there are really serious issues there about the, uh, the, the, the interface between the public and private sectors. Uh, in, in, a, in a very generic sense, uh, you know, today's conversation is perfectly open. Uh, I'm talking to you and I suppose that anyone who wants to hear this can listen to it. Uh, nevertheless, we are operating on a private sector platform uh, owned by someone. And in, a, in addition, owned by a company which was not founded in Europe. So there's also this question of, uh, of sovereignty. And I'm sure that the two members of the European Parliament are probably sensitive to the fact that many of the technologies that we were using, not only in scientific research, but in all areas of innovation and technology during the COVID pandemic, were essentially coming from other continents. And uh, is that creating a vulnerability? Does that mean that uh, we are in a position where there's a risk that maybe some of these things that we take for granted as being open information are, are no longer open, or at least potentially. Now, this brings up some serious issues of censorship that we're currently experiencing a little bit further to the east right now. Huh? Um, I, I think these issues are important, and I know that I know that as members of Parliament, I'm sure that Clara and, and Carlos are concerned about this and are, and are thinking about it very seriously. But um, I, the, I should mention here that the academic community in general is very concerned about this, uh, much more than the general public thinks. So I, I think I'll I'll just leave it there. I think it's a very interesting point. I think the um, you know it, it, it's a it, it's interesting that that you know where we we have this this global uh, global pandemic um, that coincided with a, with a moment of where we seem to be heading towards a, um, a, a, a de-globalization trend. Um, and, and, and in a way, the thing that's kind of got us, got us through uh, the pandemic has been the, you know, the, the availability of, 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 of uh, 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 global platforms, uh, kind of global technologies, um, um, uh, global infrastructures that are underpinned by global supply chains, um, and yet uh, perhaps uh, we've been become more aware of the the vulnerabilities in that um, than than, uh, than than ever ever before. Um, Clara, I wanted I wanted to come come to you because um, Aaron Aaron made what was a really interesting really interesting question in in that you know he talked about this idea of um, you know if we're thinking about technology in, in this future world. You know, we we need you need to think. You know, if you if you don't design the future, somebody else will. Um, um, but he also said that um, uh, when he looked around the world at governments, that the governments seem to be kind of stepping back in a way from the designing role and and seem to be much more in the reactive. Well, we'll fix things when they go wrong. Um, now, you know, clearly there are you know I would argue there are benefits to that in in, in as much as uh, you know let the market innovate and then and then you know. The role for government is to come in and, and to, to regulate and fix, but but government does have a sort of design role, doesn't it? And it, and it, and 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 it comes back to a point I made. I think I made earlier about about purpose. You know how we use technology. With purpose. Does do, you know? Does the European Union? Does the EU member states? Do, do do enough governments? You know, really think about using technology with purpose and 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 about how we can create the good life in a way and not just kind of fix the things as they go wrong. Uh, well, uh, I'm definitely sure that Carlos will come into this topic as well, uh, but uh, Aaron is, is absolutely right. Governments and politicians at that moment are reacting uh, to, the, uh, to the world and uh, trying to, first of all, a little bit take care of those who, who are the losers, 
on the one side and uh, to use the benefits uh, in, in different aspects. But that would be an interesting topic, how proactive can government be in this uh, field? Uh, Michael told already, and that's a very important uh, point, uh, especially for me, as I told you, I'm a social democrat, so I really do believe that uh, uh, we need uh, public uh, uh, regulation and we need state and a good and effective state, transparent one, uh, that even the innovations, the private innovations, the tech innovations, they are financed publicly. Uh, so in that way, actually, these are the public funds and these are the funds distributed by politicians, so to say, who at the end result, uh, uh, the design of our, our uh, uh, state. Um, at that moment, uh, I think that politicians are going to take care and to go a little bit behind and maybe to be innovative in how to use the new technologies, how to be more transparent, how to be more democratic. Uh, Carlos mentioned already that the European Parliament shifted in 10 days towards an absolutely online uh, way of sitting and voting. Uh, will it make possibilities for online voting, uh, a, a new way of democracy, maybe every day, uh, consulting with people to have a much more direct uh, uh, democracy, not only based on representation. These are questions at that moment. And um, of course, we are always talking about if we are, there's an ongoing conference in the future of Europe, for example, about does the technology allow us to go to a more direct uh, democracy? Is it good to the world to have more direct uh, democracy or we should keep um, going on with the representation and with the parliamentary uh, uh, democracies. These are really questions which are still debated. Um, but Aaron brought up the example of China and to tell you the truth that made me a little bit worried about whether is it the government's role to design or not? Now, I'll leave it as a question. <laughs> Carlos, is it the government's role or not? Should we, should we, and, and obviously, I mean, China is an example, but, but and, and, and clearly there is a spectrum of, you know, of, of how far you go in, in, in. This is a kind of, of question that there are so, so, so many possibilities to address this question, but uh, let me to, to, to address by the by the, the perspective of the comp of the, the global competition, for instance, that uh, in a new economy that is based in access to data, and uh, look which is the now the 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 game. One side you have China that has access of all the data, personal data, without any barriers. That is a place where the United States, it is very easy to access data. It's a, a question of money or some gifts. And you have uh, Europe that is more and more difficult to access for the, our companies, for our universities, for our innovators to access data. But we think that you are, uh, we have reason to have more uh, to, to protect privacy. So I think that we need to develop in the in the Europe, as we uh, develop also a green deal to try to, to fight the climate change, to make a data deal with the citizens, to try to find that, and to try to to have a model when where the data is used to help governments to empower citizens in their choices to design the future. Okay, I think that accept the technology technological determinism is a defeat. If, if I accept the technology, the determinism, you don't need more political, <laughs> politics or political people, no? But we know that it's important to care how the technology is used to design things in the world. And you need to empower people to make these choices. And we represent these people. Another question that is very interesting is the question of the, the, new, uh, the new concept. It begins in France, we have the elections in France in, uh, uh, next Sunday, but uh, the concept of strategic autonomy. 
about the concept of strategic autonomy, you, you could you, you, we could also discuss a lot because I think that strategic autonomy could mean protectionism, and protectionism usually means war and uh, authoritarianism and uh, poverty, or strategic autonomy could mean multilateralism. Could mean that all in the chain as part of the key of the chain. So all, are, uh, all the members in the value chain or in the decision chain are uh, important uh, as the key of the, the, the value process. And this is very, very important. This is a choice also for, for Europe uh, to make uh, as an alternative to other imperialist uh, so, so models. This is really, really very, very important in, in, in my perspective. And, and I, I give you two, two examples. The, the, the debate about vaccines. Some people uh, say that it's important to, 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 to sell vaccines, yes, because uh, we need money to, 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 to develop the, the, these medicine products, but also to give vaccines uh, to the vulnerable countries. But some people say what is important is to, uh, to, to create the conditions to produce vaccines in all the world, okay? Now with the food shortage, this morning I have a debate in the F committee about the, what is now is a catastrophe now with the, the problems of cereals from Ukraine, Ukraine, Ukraine and the Russia and so on, which is the, which is what you need to do is perhaps to put money in the, in the different countries to produce is our food. So this is very important to, 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 to think about how to use technology, how to use these networks, to promote a kind of strategic autonomy that empowers people and uh, protect democracy. Always thought today's uh, uh, discussion had the potential to be wide ranging, and it, it, it definitely has been. Um, we've got about twenty minutes left, and and so I wanted to focus in now on um, on, a, on a question for for each of you, um, which is really about what would you like to see happen now that's that's different so as we as we're uh you know we're we're coming out of uh you know the worst hopefully the worst period of of of, of the pandemic uh, our societies have been changed by it in 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 many many different ways both positive and negative um uh we have seen the potential um uh of technology to to uh kind of change things quite dramatically quite quite quickly and and again you know and 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 i think we've seen also the idea of you know i think we all, we've all agreed that it's it it is we have the power to choose the future and, and and to make the future so as you as you think about all of those things i'd be interested in 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 you know what it is that you would like to see happen differently and it, it could be you know a very macro thing or it could be a very specific um uh uh initiative but um, just to get you know your your thoughts on what what could happen that could make a positive difference, um, and that you know it would be in your wish list for um, uh, the world as it as it as, as we are today and as we emerge into this new new reality. Um, and I don't know. I'm, I'm trying to expand, give you a little bit of time to <laughs> to formulate uh, thoughts. But uh, Michael, can I go to you first? Well, you know, it turns out that this COVID thing was a relatively minor thing, right? Because if you think about it, it's a relatively uh, modest uh, respiratory illness, which generates a, a, a relatively modest number of uh, deaths and mortalities, even though many of us know people, even in our close neighbors, uh, people who were affected by it, people who died from it. Uh, but if you think about it on a global scale, it was a relatively modest uh, uh, impacting factor on, uh, on the human race as such. And it had this colossal impact on the way we reacted to it with the technologies. And so the question that I'm asking myself and, and a number of people are asking themselves is, is is this COVID pandemic thing and the way we reacted to it, 
Only a beta test for the robustness of the technological infrastructures, or is it something much, much greater, which is a sort of dress rehearsal for how we are going to deal with climate change? Because climate change is not a minor respiratory illness that may uh, create mortality for a small percentage of the population. It is a risk for the extinction of the human race. So if you could justify shutting down the entire economy of the world in 2020 for a respiratory illness that only affects a small portion of the population, wouldn't it seem reasonable that in the next 10 or 20 years, we would get to a point where it would be easy to justify shutting down the entire universe, basically, uh, to deal with the climate change issue. And there, the questions of the sort of governance that we want to have in the world is going to be really, really center stage. Uh, I am not convinced that the type of authoritarian approach that was adopted in this particular case it can be extended easily to uh, a much larger domain, uh, which is the domain of the real issue for the survival of humanity, which is the climate change issue. Uh, if you, I don't know what our, I'm, I'm sort of seeing this as for our members of parliament to see how they react to this, but you know, this was a pretty authoritarian approach for something that was not so serious. So what does this mean? Does this mean now that we can justify shutting down things authoritatively anywhere in the future, I think is a real serious issue. And comparing the approaches that we would like to use in Europe with approaches that are currently being adopted in places like China, uh, the zero COVID approach in China has not been adopted in the rest of the world. And I think uh, correctly so. Uh, you can see what's currently happening in Shanghai and, and, and the, 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 the real, uh, the, the, the really tremendous difficulties for the population that that creates. Uh, so I don't think that the authoritarian approach, we shut everything down, is the right way to go. But what is the right way to go? And uh, so probably what I would hope, and uh, if you were asking what I would like to see, uh, is that we find some way in the spirit of what Clara was saying to renew our uh, democratic institutions so that we can use them in a way that will help us to face global challenges uh, which are in front of us. So let's not, uh, let's not uh, you know, uh, lie to ourselves. There are going to be big, big things happening in the future that are going to require global action and uh, probably much more serious than what we just lived through. So how do we deal with that? Um, I would hope that uh, this would be a, a sort of a shockwave that would help us to, uh, to think about it. Carlos is asking questions. How should we go about this? How should we change the democratic system? Uh, Clara is thinking about it. Uh, what kind of things can we do uh, to improve the trust in our democratic institutions? I, I would hope that this was what would be coming out of, uh, uh, out of this on the next step. I, I can't help but think of the, the sort of the parallel being you know, the world coming out of the shock of the Second World War, where it, it went about creating lots of new international institutions, um, uh, not least of which the European Union being one of them, but, uh, you know, the United Nations, International Monetary Fund, and so on. Um, but but it, in a way, this it sort of feels a bit like we're emerging from the First World War than the Second World War at the moment, with, uh, you know, maybe a League of Nations at best. So um, I, uh, I, I, I I see where you're coming from, Michael. I I, I Kind of question about whether whether if I look around the world today, literally out of my window, uh, I, I'm not sure I see that that impulse. But I but I, I absolutely I totally agree with you that that um, you know there is this, as you say, almost you know, well there is this existential threat coming, and and as yet we don't seem to have adjusted to it. Um, Carlos, can I come to you for your what you would like to see happen next? It's a one million dollar question. Uh, it's very difficult to 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 make uh, a, a, any prognosis about that. Uh, 
for instance, uh, the, the new architecture of uh, uh, the European project uh, is completely dependent of the uh, result of the, 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 the votes Sunday in France. <laughs> for instance, uh, if uh, the, the surveys are, are correct, uh, you can perhaps to have an, a, a change in the perspective more, more countries could uh, access to Europe. Europe could have a stronger uh, uh, role in the in NATO, in the OTAN, in NATO. Uh, so it means uh, if you if you if you are uh, together in, in in security, you need also to to to, to be more together in uh, other uh, in other networks and. Uh, uh, Perhaps we have uh, not uh, an, an Europe in different uh, in, in different geometries. If I, I, I usually defend, but perhaps uh, two or three uh, dynamic uh, groups in Europe. But it's very difficult to to understand what what will happen. Uh, it's a, it's a, a moment of disruption in the global order. Uh, I think that what is important is to, to maintain this, uh, these links of multilateralism and these links as Europe only is relevant, uh, uh, is, is linked with uh, Africa, with South uh, uh, America and so on, and also South America and Africa uh, and India all are relevant, that's, if they are linked with Europe. If not, we, we will have the big show of two big potencies. Uh, uh, by, by fighting the world, one part leading by United States, it's my part, <laughs> and the other part uh, leading by, by China. Uh, only one, one thing, uh, one answer to, to Michael uh, about the, the, the European uh, answer to, to vaccines. I think it's extraordinary. And it's extraordinary because it's an example. Yes, there are always people that uh, have uh, some schemes to, 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 to not follow the, the rules, but it's extraordinary that people have access to vaccines not because they have money, but because it's the age, is the moment, is the... This is absolutely extraordinary. It's not other example. In Portugal, I, I have a friend that uh, is... Uh, because they have money and the power, they took the vaccine and he close the, the, the next election, all the consideration and reputation in the society because in vaccines in Europe is okay, is led by governments, but is first for the people that needs to be vaccinated. It's an extraordinary example. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. Um, Clara, can I come to you for your what you would like to see happen next? Well, what I would like to see, um, well, then I will continue where Carlos stopped because, uh, well, you know, I'm I'm a very strong and outspoken federalist. I really do believe in the United States of Europe, whatever it's going to call uh, in the future. Uh, so definitely uh, what I think that a stronger Europe with much stronger cooperation with the US, with Canada, uh, will lead, and other city, uh, countries as well, will lead to a much stronger position in the world, whether it's Africa versus South America, whether it's Asia. But there is something, uh, just to go back to the climate change and COVID, um, you know, in democracy, uh, if you want to do something, you have to have the people on board. I mean, you can have whatever ideology and ideas about how to design the future. But if you don't have the people on, on board, then these plans are going to fail. Um, and in, 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 in case of COVID, you had the people on board because everyone was frightened. Of course, now we are much more clever and we could have done it much better and so on. But, but at the beginning, this was something absolutely new and terrifying to everyone. Um, and the world digital transformation, for me, it's the same like the wall uh, uh, climate transformation, we have to bring people on board. Mm -hmm. And you might ask, and, and Michael will, is going to be absolutely right. I mean, come on, just look around. Why, are, why aren't you on board? I mean, it's getting hot, it's getting dirty, and we are going to die. I mean, what else do you need? You could ask the people. But the people would say that uh, they can be on board when they feel that they are safe. 
And in the last 30 years, one of the strongest, I think, uh, influence what weakened this kind of solidarity and this kind of view to the future in our societies was the increasing inequalities in, uh, in the last, let's say, approximately 30 years. Um, if I may say the American dream is a, not an American dream anymore. Uh, uh, you could say, I mean, come on, I just have to learn and work and then I can be whoever. And you see that even in America, uh, simply these kind of um, uh, uh, bridges, somehow they are missing. And, and the first generation grow up whose life living standard is not going to be better than their parents or grandparents living standard. Uh, and, and that's very painful for everyone. After the Second World War, we are facing this and we have to deal with it. I'm talking about it because it's not simply economic and social policy like sanctions, social benefits and so on. It's environmental policies. You cannot put the burden uh, on again on the poorest one and to increase, I, I don't know, the fuel prices without having any other, um, uh, um, any other incentives and, and helping them because then you have the yellow vest like it was in France. I mean, you have have to take into the consideration. And coming back to our topic, the same goes for the new technology and how we are going to design our world, as Aaron said. Uh, you have to have people on board and you have to help them to be on, bo on board in order to use the new technologies, to uh, use this digital era uh, for a better uh, future, uh, to save the climate, save the people, to have a better life. To tell you the truth, I'm very optimistic. I think at the end, Mankind is going to succeed. I just want to go it in a straight way and not to make 10 or 15 years of all around uh, and, and making it more painful. So that's what I'm thinking. We have to have everybody on board. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Aaron, over to you for the, the kind of your, your last, you, you pulled all the threads together so brilliantly earlier on, kind of, uh, uh, how do we how do we knit all this together in, in, a, in a way that, that that can meet Clara's kind of optimism for the for the future for our joint future? Well, um, I'm, uh, I'm 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 neither optimistic nor pessimistic at this point. Um, you know, I um, <clears throat> you know I, I I sort of go back to um, you know sort of some of the points that were raised earlier, which is. Um, you know, the, the sooner we get away from the idea that the digital is what is shaping things and realize that um, a, a, a lot of the, you know, um, a lot of what is mixed up as the challenges associated with digital and like, you know, what is the right path forward um, are really rooted in you know, sort of political and economic changes that began in the late 70s, early 80s in the US and the UK, right, during, during the Reagan-Thatcher years. And, um, you know, I, I'm, 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 I'm not, you know, sort of coming out on the side of, like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not in any way trying to sort of oppose the primacy of free markets or, um, you know, suggest that, you know, they, 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 they don't have their benefits. But, you know, we, we, we have to see the development of sort of today's technologies and their impacts within that broader political context, right? And if we do want a um, sort of to have optimism about the path, like, you know, the future, the digital future, um, like, you know, that's only realistic if we have some optimism about changes to sort of like, you know, the political economy surrounding those digital developments. And um, my, my feelings, you know, I, I, I don't follow, I guess, sort of like, you know, the European countries or China or Japan as closely as I do the United States because I live here. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think a number of us are deeply pessimistic about our ability to change the political economy. Um, broken though it may be, <clears throat> just sort of that there, there seems to sort of be no viable path forward. And so from that point of view, um, you know, whatever the, like, you know, sort of whatever the other stakeholders in society might do to sort of push us towards a more optimistic future, 
um, that's that's sort of going to be a barrier. I mean, you know, I, you know, I'm 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 sort of uh, you know, I, I I I do agree with a lot of what um, Carla, Clara, and Carlos have, have 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 sort of asserted, and you know, I mean, they 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 clearly sort of have a more nuanced and sort of deeper understanding of the politics than I do. Um, but you know, maybe maybe the path forward is sort of small steps. And if you take Michael's idea of like, you know, sort of fighting for um, the, you know, sort of the universal availability of these universal public goods, um, you know, our, <clears throat> you know, our digital society is sort of built on a foundation of sort of having had access to such technologies, right? I mean, not just, um, you know, the commercial internet, but, you know, even sort of later innovations um, you know, like Nutella and BitTorrent and these peer-to-peer -peer networks, you know, were created as public goods in the United States and, um, you know, Defense Department and DARPA, but, you know, they were put out there as like, you know, go ahead and use this technology, GPS, all of these things that are sort of completely fundamental to, um, you know, sort of our, um, our, our digital economy, you know, were built on the back of, um, <clears throat> you know, these public goods and, you know, not just in the scientific domain, you know, the privatization of these, not just in the scientific domain, I've seen a lot of uh, promising doctoral students go to work for big tech companies because that's sort of where the data is, right? I mean, you know, that's where I can do better marketplace experiments. That's where I can, you know, learn more about, um, you know, human social interaction because of, you know, having sort of the digital microscope to be able to observe it. But it's not just in sort of research data availability, but it's in sort of fundamental building blocks to like, you know, sort of like, you know, the Apples and the Googles and, you know, the Ubers of tomorrow. Um, you know, that, that, that might be sort of a little step um, towards. So, you know, I, I, I see the path of sort of being trying to sort of chip away, you know, sort of within the confines of the political economy that we're in at, um, you know, sort of trying, trying to sort of like, you know, get some, you know, because I, I, I have believed for many years that um, if you get, <clears throat> if you imbue within a platform sort of a sense of, um, you know, um, the importance of political communication early enough in their life, um, you put them on a better trajectory. And, and some people are confused by this. They're like, don't you put them on a worse trajectory because you're giving them sophistication and political communication and you know, they're going to shape the world to be what they want to even more. But that's not the case because I think when platforms like Google and Facebook reached the point where they understood the extent to which like, you know, sort of um, their operations are tied up in the broader social and political context, um, they had gotten too big for a shareholder company to sort of take real assertive meaningful action because it might sort of involve dramatically lowering you know, earnings. And so if this happens early on enough, then you sort of put yourself on a path where you're sort of striking a good balance. And so maybe the next generation of platforms will be, you know, um, like, you know, we will we'll start to think of being more responsible social actors faster. And I keep going back to platforms because to me, they are the most important institutions of the 21st century. And they are going to determine the answer to the question that you pose. But, um, you know, that's, that's sort of where I am. And um, I'll stop now and like, you know, let you wrap up in the last. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much, Aaron. I mean, I, I do agree. I think, um, it, you know, I, I think, you know, the way to a positive future is, is probably certainly around, you know, small steps. Um, and and, uh, and I, I think, I mean, I mean, you know, history seems sort of, the, you know, the, the, the last 22 years of the, of the 21st century, just so much seems to have happened, you know, and, and I think, to Clara's point, I think for a lot of people, it has been um, uh, sort of disorientating. And, and I think a lot of people do. <clears throat> wish for a kind of simpler world, um, uh, a more a safer, more predictable world. Um, but um, but I, but I think what we've also had over the last three two years is so much that we can learn from. Um, I think we can learn from uh, you know this incredible uh, acceleration in, in the pace of, of technological in innovation. Uh, we can learn from what happens when you democratize these incredibly powerful um, 
technologies kind of very quickly. Uh, we can learn from what happens when companies you know, reach this very, very significant scale, uh, as Aaron was pointing out. Um, um, and I think we can learn from the what we experienced in the pandemic about uh, our ability to adapt and change and, and, and work and, and, and live uh, in a different way, uh, which to Michael's point, you know, may well be very, very instructive and important for us when we when we think about these big challenges of, of, of uh, climate change that, you know, we, we cannot avoid, we're going to have to face them. Um, we have run out of time. Um, over the last two years, I've had lots of interesting conversations sitting here in my bedroom in, in West London. Um, and uh, But this has been right up there in terms of really interesting, really fascinating, really stimulating. Uh, so uh, Michael Matlos, uh, Carlos Zarino, uh, Clara Dobrev and Aaron Sadrajan, thank you so much. It's um, uh, been a fantastic conversation. Um, and um, uh, Thank you for your time and, and I hope those who've been watching online or who will watch this online uh, will take some in, real inspiration from the session. So a huge thank you for me. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Anthony. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. Everyone, you can follow this interesting discussion. Ciao.